What is hell and who goes there? Ever thought about these things? Uh, is hell a real place or just the figment uh, of someone's warped uh, imagination? And if there is a God and if God is uh, all loving and all kind, how can this God uh, send people to hell? Well, what is hell? Is hell just the invention uh, of the medieval church with all its paintings of hellfire and brimstone and uh, torment uh, for souls uh, just to scare people and to get money uh, out of them? And now it's all a, a big joke and we think about uh, cartoon devils with pitchforks and cauldrons and uh, it's all part of that mystical uh, medieval past. Uh, and now we're in a modern scientific world that has no place uh, for the horrors such as hell. But then why is it that hell features so much in our language and even in our own experience? Uh, we often summon up the idea of hell as something uh, so awful, destruction, misery, uh, and even justice uh, as well. We can go to parts of the world that were once uh, beautiful and green and lush and to me admired, a kind of paradise. But because of our greed and our selfishness, the way that we have trashed so much of this planet, it's been turned uh, into a hell. Certainly through warfare has created hell in much uh, of the world, from the dropping of the atom bomb in the 1940s to modern wars, uh, where places where people once lived and enjoyed uh, life and had families and, and uh, these kind of things have been turned uh, through man's warfare uh, into a hell. We get blasé, don't we, about what we see on the TV uh, of these places. But to live through them, we say it's like living through hell. We use these expressions all the time, don't we? And there are still some surviving servicemen who, at the end of the Second World War, were there as part of the liberation of the, tr the tr concentration camps uh, of Nazi Germany. And they saw things there that they described as uh, hell on earth, uh, things that were beyond uh, their imagination in terms of the horrors of what cruelty people can do to each other. But sometimes our own life circumstances, the choices uh, that we make, uh, the mistakes we make, the things that we do can create a hell for ourselves. Uh, people say, I'm living through hell. Uh, they might joke about it. Uh, they might even make a TV series about it. We have neighbours from hell, don't we? And restaurants from hell and homes from hell. But we use this expression to describe something which is unbearably miserable, unrelenting and horrendous. We might experience that for ourselves. And also we summon it as a kind of justice. Uh, just a few years ago, the Moore's murderer, Ian Brady, uh, died. He died at the end of a long prison sentence. He died of a terrible illness. But the tabloid headline uh, on the day after ran like this, Burn in Hell, Brady. Uh, suddenly hell was summoned as ultimate justice. And maybe you said, what about the Jimmy Savills? What about the Adolf Hitlers? Is there not justice for them? Uh, is there a hell uh, for them? So what is hell? Where can we go to find the answers beyond the myths and the speculations and the language that we use all the time? Well, the Bible has a great deal to tell us about hell. God warns us in his word that hell is hell, that hell uh, is real. It talks about a place of eternal destruction, of banishment, of separation from God and all that God is good uh, to people a place where there's misery and regret and all these things. The things we perhaps pick up on in our own ideas about hell, the Bible explains clearly, particularly through the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said. What does the Bible say about the reality of what hell is? Well, the first thing it says is that it is the justice that we deserve. Now that's an idea we find absolutely offensive because we say, well, I'm not as bad as the Jimmy Savills, the Ian Bradys, the Adolf Hitlers. Uh, I've done nothing wrong. I'm fine. I'm OK. But you see, we're dealing with a perfect God uh, with perfect standards. Uh, God's given us his law in the Bible, the Ten Commandments. And we might read through that and say, well, no one's perfect. But friend, that's our problem because God is perfect. He loves his perfect law, perfect truth, perfect love perfect standards and the bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and god is absolutely just he's a just judge and he's angry with the wicked 
every day. He hates lies. He hates cruelty. He hates selfishness and self-centeredness. He also hates the pride that we try and cover over our sins with. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. At the end of the day, friend, who will be proved true, God or you and me, as we lie to ourselves and try and convince ourselves that for a holy, perfect God, we're okay. God's word goes on to say that for those who are self-seeking and who do not disobey the truth, there'll be wrath and anger. If we reject the truth of who God is as his awesome creator, uh, reject the truth of his word that he's given to us, and particularly the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as God into our world, the Son of God, who said, I am the truth. If we reject all of those things and what is left for us, but the wrath of God and the anger of God, if we continue living self-centred, self-pleasing lives, then this is what God has for us. In fact, we condemn ourselves. You can read for yourself an account in John's Gospel, John chapter 3, where Jesus sat down with a, a religious teacher, a well-meaning man, a fine figure of the community. He said, look, uh, unless you believe in me, you're condemned already. Our sins condemn us. Today we're condemned. And that was a shock uh, for that man to realise that even though he was a religious man, the fact that he was a sinner, as we all are, means that we are condemned. And that hell is the justice, the justice of God uh, that we deserve separated from him for eternity in a place where the Lord Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and misery, regret and punishment. And of course, no one wants to go there, but we will unless we turn to this God who has sent his son that we might escape it. So the second thing about hell that we must say from the word of God, it is the penalty that Christ has paid. In that conversation with Nicodemus, the Lord Jesus said this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It is belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the person of who he is, as the son of God, who became a man to suffer and to die upon the cross and to pay the price of sin. God's word says that Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God, to remove that separation. The fact that God's eyes are too pure to look upon sin, and yet he must look upon sin, he must judge it as a just judge. Christ came to pay for sins on the cross, to remove the sins of those who have put their faith and trust in him and in his work. The Lord Jesus Christ enjoyed a perfect relationship with his father God when he was a man on the earth but on the cross he cried out my God my God why have you forsaken me during that time the father turned his face away from his son and that was the price that Christ was paying the justice of God was unleashed upon his son he had never sinned yet he bore the sins of sinners like you and I and that is why when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe on that work, there is no condemnation. How can I know that as a sinner, by trusting in Christ, I am not condemned? Well, Christ suffered for sins, but he also cried out on the cross, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished, but it, the work he came to do, to stand in the place of sinners. The Bible says that this is love, not that we have loved God, because we can't. We want to be God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the one who would bear the weight, the anger, the wrath of our sin from God, to bear the justice, to bear it away and to pay the price for us upon the cross. And that means the judge can say to us that your sins have been forgiven. The Bible says that only God can forgive sins. And the only way he can forgive sins is if another takes the place of the sinner to receive the penalty. And that's what Jesus did upon the cross. How wonderful to not be condemned by the one who should condemn us because we're sinners, 
but has sent his son to bear our sins away. So the third thing we must say about hell, it is the eternity that you can and you must escape. This is the whole point, friends, of God's good news to you. It starts with the bad news that we are sinners under the condemnation of a just and a holy God, but that Christ Jesus stepped in to pay that price. And therefore, by faith in him, by repenting of our sins and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour, we can know forgiveness and we can know the grace of God in our lives. We can escape that penalty. The psalmist writes, how happy, how wonderfully happy, how blessed is the one whose law breaking is forgiven, whose sins are covered. And that's what happens when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look upon him on the cross, paying for our sins, and that, as the hymn writer says, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. This is who Jesus Christ is, my friends. And you must put your faith and trust uh, in him. The message of the Bible is this. And this is the message the Lord Jesus Christ preached. And we're preaching to you today to repent of your sins and believe the good news. To turn from your sins, to admit that you are a sinner before a holy God. It is painful. It is humbling. But you must realise that that we are deceiving ourselves if we say we have no sin. But if we confess our sins, then he, the Lord God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all that is evil and wicked and godless and unrighteous in it. He must, because he looks to the work of Christ on the cross and he sees that work, his beloved son, that work that he delights in, that he might bring sinners to himself. The Lord Jesus told a story about two men praying uh, in the temple one day. And the first man prayed, uh, he like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like that person. I'm not as bad as them. They deserve uh, your wrath and punishment. But I'm basically a good person. I've done this and I've done this. And he was justifying himself. But the other man realised that he was a sinner. He realised the truth of God's word. He realised what he deserved from a just judge. And all he could pray is this. God have mercy upon me, a sinner. He humbled himself under the justice of God and he pleaded God's mercies. Literally, he prayed, God, be the covering that I need for my sins. Bear my sins away and forgive me for all my sins. And the punchline of the story was this. Jesus said it was that man who went home right with God, justified by God because he pleaded the mercies of a gracious, forgiving God. Friend, we urge you today to do what the Bible says, to turn from your sins. Why should you die? Why should you suffer the condemnation when God has sent his son to pay the price, to bear the penalty, that you might go free, that you might know no condemnation from this God, that rather than God be your eternal judge, he becomes at your loving heavenly father and you know him personally. Why not read the Bible today, friend? Find out what God says about what we are really like, but what he has done to send such a saviour who bore our sins away, who rose from the dead to give life, hope, forgiveness and heaven for eternity. Thank you.